Alright guys, how's it going? It's time for another tech talk, which by now you probably recognise as me being out of the really deep subjects to talk about, so instead decided to lump together a bunch of smaller talking points in the hope of still providing some kind of interesting video for you. Oh boy, this didn't start well. So as part of my waking up routine, which involves at least two cups of strong tea, I read through some of my emails and I check out Twitter. A couple of days ago I was tagged in this tweet by Anantex Ian Curtis. Interested in testing hardware and analysing it? Or dissecting industry changes? We are interested. With HS tagging me asking, why don't you sign up? Seems like something that could greatly benefit both parties. So let's go over to Anantech and check out their Call for Writers 2019. The Call for Writers is something of an annual tradition over here at Anantech. We're looking for writers with a true passion for the technology we cover, a deep understanding of what's out there, and a thirst for more knowledge. And if we just scroll down to the comments section. Second comment, you guys should get Jim from Adore TV over on YouTube. He knows his stuff. And right below that, I second Jim from Adore TV. Now, I'm talking about this for a few reasons. First is that I wanted to bring Anantech's call for writers to your attention. As some of you watching this will be more than capable of meeting this challenge, Second is just to say that I am never going to be writing for Anantech or any other major publication. My response on Twitter was, while the idea sounds like fun, I'm not sure it would be in Anantech's best interests. You all know that I hold Anantech in the highest regard, among the tech press. Back in the day, Anand and Derek held very little back when laying into tech companies for all the crap that they pulled. I've noticed previously how Derek slammed NVIDIA for their rebranding back in the G80, G92 days, and how he labelled the 8800 Ultra as an utter waste of money, while Anand himself told us about how, when he first started testing Clarkdale, he actually had to call Intel and ask them to explain why this wasn't a worthless product. This was the good old days when enthusiasts and the tech press still held some kind of influence over these companies. Can you imagine what would happen if any of them said this stuff today though? They'd just get blacklisted. Today it's different, and while Anantech do still ask the probing questions that others don't dare to ask, they do it in a heavily sanitised manner, compared to previous years. In short, they have a filter. I am this era, the Anand and Derek era. The Kyle of Hard OCP and Tom of Tom's Hardware era. All these guys were hard but fair. Mostly. Today's tech writers cover a range between complete corporate sellouts to a few probing journalists and tech writers who have enough of a filter required of them to remain advertiser friendly. I am never going to have that filter and it just makes me far too much of a liability regarding both advertising and just simply relations with certain companies. Can you imagine the hissy fit that Intel and Nvidia would throw if Anantech took me on as a writer? Intel talked to me a little, but won't even give me normal press access. Nvidia just ignored me completely. The fact is, I don't need a filter for either of those companies, and I never will. But there is another reason too though, and that is, most of Anantech's writers are very competent in technical matters. I would rate them as a 7 or 8, possibly even a 9 out of 10 in some cases. I would only rate myself as a 6 or a 7 at best. I'm talking about the really technical stuff, the deep dives and all that. I mean sure, I've done some decent work in that in the past, like my interposers, chiplets, butter donuts video, my path tracing video, which is now clearly my most viewed video, and more recently was my explanation of cash. However, I am more of an analyst slash researcher than an extremely good technical writer. To be fair, this stuff is just about learning and time to learn, obviously. All of these guys writing at Anantech are far better than they were even three or four years ago. However, I just don't think that writing to this standard time and again will ever be my particular forte. But if you think it's yours, then please do go ahead. I could use some more allies in high places. The final reason why I talked about this, though, was the continuation of the last comment I looked at. I second Jim from Adore TV. He seems to be a lot less excited and motivated nowadays, though. The next seven or eight minutes of this video covers topics like hate and drama. If you're not interested and just want the tech stuff, then please skip ahead to around about the 12 minute mark of the video. There's no denying it. Since about mid December, my motivation for creating video just hasn't been the same. But still, my last 10 videos or so 
Or if we go all the way back to the AMD Evolving Master Plan, these videos have been getting longer and longer. The average duration has been over 30 minutes in my last 12 videos. And there has been some good ones in there, like the cash one, I thought that was pretty decent. And most people enjoyed my Radio and 7 review. But there's something missing, and I have been feeling it for months. I've always been someone who feeds on positive news, which is strange because most people would say that I am someone who focuses more on the negatives, which is true. I mean, this Radio on 7 review focused on the negatives, but also how to fix the worst of it. I also feed off positive comments. I mean, who wouldn't love to read stuff like this about themselves? Of course, I like to see people say positive things about my work, and we all do. However, since this Ryzen 3000 leak, and AMD's subsequent no-show at CES. There's been a lot more grumbling and negative comments than usual. I read everything, and it's causing me a problem. And my problem is that I simply cannot help but get involved in discussion, though mostly for all the wrong reasons. I would read through the comments on Reddit on my latest video, and the vast, vast majority of them are positive comments. 90 could be positive, while 10 are negative. And as someone who focuses more on the negatives, guess what kind of comments I tend to focus on? To be frank, the majority of negative comments are just downright lies, fabrications, or misunderstandings. I feel a need to correct the lies and misunderstandings because these things have a way of being spread around. You know what they say about telling a lie often enough, and people do start to believe it. So I've been spending way, way too much time arguing with some people, hoping to make them see the truth. It is a waste of time because in years of arguing with these people, I don't think I've ever had one agree that they were in the wrong. <laughs> Take this guy for example. After my Radio on 7 review, which showed the stutter for the RTX 2080 in Geothermal Valley, this guy first of all accused of making it all up. At which point I showed him two different sources who had the same or a similar issue in Geothermal Valley with Nvidia cards. First up was Cat the Fifth, who in a huge review post with benchmarks over at Hexus, had a similar issue with a GTX 1080 in Geothermal Valley again back in 2017. And next up was a Steam user who had awful stutter and massive frame rate drops on his RTX 2080 in Geothermal Valley. So after those two other issues were pointed out, this guy instead made up a story about how it was a bug which was fixed after October last year. Of course, I looked deeper into that and found that, in fact, the developers had released 14 patches for Rise of the Tomb Raider, but the final one was for December 2017, and that was also the final build on Steam. So clearly nothing there that could fix the RTX's performance because the RTX launched way after December 2017. You'd think that'd be enough to convince anyone that there was never any mythical RTX fixing patch for this game. But instead the guy goes on to speculate that it doesn't matter if it was a game patch, a driver, or the flying spaghetti monster who fixed it. Maybe even some programming fairies. They'll twist themselves in knots trying to justify their position and point blank refuse to see simple truth when presented with undeniable evidence. So you say to me, Jim, you just need to ignore it and focus on what you're good at. And I agree. However, I think most people simply do not understand the sheer volume of hate aimed in my direction. On this same Anantech Twitter thread, this idiot editor who has his own website, which looks like it's straight out of 2007, attempts to start something on Twitter by saying, please don't, we have enough fake news in the world. Like I am fake news. And of course on Anantech's site, you don't need to look very far to see Jim knows his stuff, knows what stuff exactly. His hit piece on Cascade Lake was pathetic, it's like Charlie cloned himself. So much baseless Intel hate. Now, I'm pretty sure that to most of us, the mere idea that Intel can get baseless hate is bizarre enough. They've been found guilty of anti-competitive, anti-consumer behaviour in almost every jurisdiction on the planet. Any hate that Intel gets is certainly not baseless. However, what's even more bizarre is Charlie, the semi-accurate owner, has some of the best sources in the industry and is also one of the very best technical writers, like an 8 or a 9 out of 10. I think most people realise that that is the truth, yet somehow it is evading this guy who believes comparing me to Charlie is an insult instead. Now, he's clearly just a ridiculous Intel fanboy. However, had I responded to one of these three comments, 
you know which one I would have responded to, right? But don't for a minute think it's only the Intel fanboys that give me crap. In my GTX Turing piece, finally, after what felt like years of terrible graphics cards from both companies, Nvidia finally released something that is not utterly awful in the 1660 Ti. And as always, I tell it exactly as I saw it. And what happens? Didn't expect you to completely turn into an Nvidia marketing mouthpiece. Are you on their payroll now? And looks like you drank the green Kool-Aid or got on the payroll. Good thing I unsubbed. Now, the vast majority of comments on this video were positive. But guess which ones I focused on? Abuse from Intel fanboys, abuse from AMD fanboys. All that's left now is abuse from the Nvidia fanboys for the triple crown. Over at GeForce.com three weeks ago and somebody decided to put my Vega 7 Tomb Raider result to the test with their own RTX 2080. Curious, I tested the part of the game where the issue appeared, Geothermal Valley, and I can confirm this to be the case. So yet more confirmation of this VRAM issue, or whatever it is, on the RTX 2080 in this game. Couple of comments down. First mistake, watching the video by Adore TV. Second mistake, posting about it here. Well, I don't know about you guys, but if I were about to pay 800 bucks on a graphics card, I would certainly like to know about these issues which is exactly why I pointed it out in the Radio on 7 video as being a potential drawback for the RTX 2080. Of course, this fanboy would rather you were kept in the dark. Look, I am by far not the only YouTuber to suffer from this bullshit. Linus recently released a video on it. It's a funny video, actually, and he does the right thing by laughing it all off. Jay, however, is on the other side of it, and he spends more time on Twitter wars than he does on creating videos these days. And, well... I just realised that this is where I am also heading. I don't actually get anywhere near as much hate as guys like Linus or Jay gets because they are huge tech tubers. However, due to me being a researcher and constantly digging into these kind of topics, I'm seeing far more relatively. And when I was seeing it, mostly over at Reddit, I was responding to it when I could. So clearly, something needs to change. And sadly, the only change available to me that makes sense is deleting my Reddit account. And that's exactly what I'll be doing. I understand that deactivated accounts are not recoverable. I can't control what they say about me on Reddit, but I can control my Twitter account. And I can control the stupidity on my YouTube channel. A couple of clicks and that's a couple less morons I'll have to deal with in future. There will sadly be far more coming though. So to end this part of the video, and let me just apologise for putting you through this, but hopefully you understand a little bit more about what it's like to be doing this job on a daily basis, and why recently I've been a little bit jaded. All this nonsense though, it's just been part of the reason. The other part of my woes are down to having constant hardware issues. On my desktop here you can see this folder overclocking the Radeon 7. Inside the folder we can see the beginnings of a script and a bunch of videos. This was supposed to be my video this week. I had intended to create a video overclocking the Radeon 7 and I was going to go a bit further than just overclocking. I was going to find out the sweet spot, the best performance per watt characteristics, the best clock speeds and, you know, undervolting, all that kind of thing. However, my overclocking attempts have been foiled at every turn with this card. I guess though, I can still use part of this script. I reviewed AMD's new Radeon 7 graphics card a couple of weeks ago, and I'll be completely honest with you, I didn't particularly want to review the card. As you know, I gave up reviewing stuff after the RTX 2080 review, which I declared as simply not being worth my time. However, how can you pass up the opportunity to test the world's first high performance 7 nanometer chip? You can't, not if you're me at least. My major interest in Radeon 7 wasn't the card's performance versus the Nvidia competition, and I didn't really care about gaming performance either, to be honest. What interested me were the characteristics of the 7 nanometer silicon. So I agreed to review the card simply because I wanted to test out 7 nanometers. But as you saw in my moan at the end of the review, it was impossible for me to ascertain the card's actual clock speeds. Here's a video that I took of Shadow of the Tomb Raider using the press driver. You can see AMD's own performance metrics overlay on the left, and looking at the clock speeds and power readouts, it's clear that there is some kind of issue there, either with the software or perhaps the card sensors. 
Furthermore, any attempt at overclocking met with a hard system freeze. AMD is aware of this issue. We can see here on the driver page that performance metrics overlay and Radeon Walkman gauges may experience inaccurate fluctuating readings on AMD Radeon 7. I complained about them releasing the card in this unready state, asking why they couldn't just have waited a couple of more weeks. And lo and behold, a week later they had released an updated driver, 19.2.2, which supposedly fixed many issues for a lot of people. I, however, was not one of them. You can see in this video using the 19.22 driver that the problems with the readouts remain. The core clock and power values often jump all over the place and it's not just Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it's every game I've tried. And the same issue remains with the latest driver, 19.2.3. But my ability to overclock the card is improving. Here is Forza Horizon 4 at stock. Again, we can see the issue with the power and engine clock speeds. But the three benchmarks finished with an average of 105.7 frames per second. That's a Radeon 7 at its stock clocks. Upping the clock speed to 2 GHz so, and 1199 millivolts. And we see a very nice increase in performance as well. 116 FPS on average. So that was a 9.4% increase in frame rate for an 11% increase in clock speed. Due to the massive one terabyte plus memory bandwidth of the card, I would expect to see some pretty good scaling with extra clock speed, as the shader performance of the card should be the clear bottleneck in almost every case. Forza is also, I believe, quite a shader intensive game, so that could also be part of the reason. I got as far as 2050 megahertz, but I couldn't get 2100 megahertz to stick. Even with 1250 millivolts, and the fan ramped up quite high. Instead of hard locking the system, which happened with the original drivers, I was able to recover all of these hangs. However, based on this 2050 megahertz maximum clock that I got, I think we could possibly see partner cards as high as 2.1 gigahertz. These could actually be fairly decent cards, more than capable of taking on the 2080. So there has been a slow improvement in the software. But why AMD did you launch the card in this early state? What was gained? I just don't see it. 2050 MHz is around about 14% higher than what the maximum clocks out of a Vega liquid or I believe around about the 1800 MHz mark. Under liquid cooling, Radeon 7 is sure to hit 2150 MHz or higher. If it can do 2.2 GHz on water, then that would be 22% higher clocks than the Vega 64 liquid. Of course, the Radeon 7 is only 60 compute units, so keep that in mind too. What I do know though is that in terms of performance per watt, this 7 nanometer Radeon 7 is miles ahead of the Vega liquid. 7 nanometers looks to be in great shape, and of course, the whole point of my accepting the card was to figure out what that could mean for Zen 2. <laughs> Not the Radeon 7, couldn't care less. As I said in the review though, Nvidia will get some mileage out of 7 nanometers too, and by the end of this year or the middle of next year, I will be pretty amazed if Nvidia isn't clearly ahead of Navi again. I hold on to the card a little bit longer, waiting on some more fixes to overclocking, and I may finally get that video done. I have had three attempts at this that have just failed because of these issues. It makes it impossible. This video simply cannot get done with this unreliable clock speed issue. But let's move on to Zen 2 and some more recent leaks. Most recent was this one from Bizgram Asia, who in the recent past leaked both the 9900K and the 1660Ti sometime before those parts launched. Now it appears they're back at it with the Ryzen 3000 and a suspiciously similar looking list of SKUs to what we've already seen. Literally every part there is the same as my leak. Now obviously the AMD subreddit was in joyous celebration at this leak, however, I think it's worth tempering it just a little by the fact that it does look like they've basically copied my leak verbatim. The order is exactly the same. Prices actually look to be a lot higher than my leak, however, not when you convert from US dollars to Singaporean dollars, which is where Bizgram are situated. If you make that conversion, they're around about 12% higher than what my leak suggested. Of course, it wasn't long before some enterprising readers decided to find out some more, emailing the company to order a Ryzen 9 3850X. And the interesting part being, they were told the product is estimated to be in stock between 6 to 10 weeks. And this email was sent on the 4th of March. So from that date, you would be talking between the 15th of April and the 13th of May. A second emailer was giving an expected time of 8 weeks. 
which is obviously halfway between six and ten weeks. Now, here things get a little bit more interesting. Over the past week or so, I've been chatting on Twitter with Paul of Red Gaming Tech, and we've been comparing leaks and other information. Paul, too, recently tried to get some more information out of Bizgram, and his reply yesterday was that they were told not to provide any information on the chips. And now another user was told that the chips were expected to be launched in June. So this is all pretty curious. Even more so when you notice that Bizgram have removed all sign of Ryzen 3000 from the price list. Now Paul also had a leak suggest to him that the chips would launch on the 7th of July. And I had read that one elsewhere as well. However, the 7th of July is a Sunday. And I cannot remember any time in history when a company launched a product on a Sunday. Nobody works on a Sunday, so I just don't think that this can be true. I do agree that Ryzen 7 on the 7th day of the 7th month is quite compelling. And had it not been a Sunday, I could have gone with that one. As regards my side of the whole leak, I'm still sticking with what I was told and my main leaker is too, with the obvious exception that the chips weren't announced at CES. My leaker believes now that May the 1st will be a soft launch for all the non-G parts, which incidentally could be another reason to not fully trust this Bizgram leak as it does also include the G series chips there, where we're all under the impression that the 3000 G series is coming a bit later on. But my leaker believes all the regular parts launch on the 1st of May, paper launch that is, with the real launch around the Computex time frame. May the 1st is of course AMD's 50th anniversary, and they have started advertising that fact on the website. It's a really good photograph of Lisa that one. It's important to note, and please do note that the main leaker, the guy that gave me all this data on all these Ryzen 9s, Ryzen 7s, Ryzen 3s etc, he told me this two weeks ago, long before this Bizgram leak saw the light of day. And I also have another leaker who has been very reliable so far, who told me that apparently the pricing posted by Bizgram is close to what the motherboard makers have been told. However, he says that there is still no confirmed 16 core parts for launch. And that final part is interesting because we did see 12 core engineering samples a few months ago, but we still haven't seen any 16 core samples. And yesterday we got this slide from AMD's March investor presentation which was leaked and shows that AMD plans to launch the chips as they had done with the previous series, with Threadripper following Ryzen this year. So that would seem to put paid to rumours that Threadripper would be held back until 2020, or even delayed. However, it doesn't necessarily rule out a staggered release of Ryzen chips. Another rumour I read was that AMD could still launch 12 core Ryzen parts and leave 16 cores for Threadripper parts, however, that seems unlikely to me as we've already got 32 core Threadripper parts. Going back down to 16 parts, I just don't think so, but we'll see. But finally, to finish this video off, perhaps something that is even more telling. I need to be careful with this, I just can't really give you the kind of details that I would like to give you, but I believe that we will hear about the first Zen 2 major details at the end of this month, March, or right at the beginning of April. And by we, I mean the tech press. I am not under NDA, so I can say this. And no, this is just pure speculation and I have got no facts. But a recent discussion I had has led me to strongly believe that AMD will give initial Ryzen 3000 information at the end of this month. And by the end of this month, I expect to be under NDA, perhaps able to release some information at the beginning of April. I would put my confidence in this at 90%. This is just my own analysis my own speculation, so do not take it as fact. But if it doesn't happen, then I'll tell you exactly why I thought it would happen afterwards. You know what's funny is, just through the process of writing this script for this video, I went from utterly jaded to feeling just that little spark of excitement. Once again, we are getting closer and closer to Judgment Day. It's safe to say that this video hasn't been a classic, however, I think maybe the mojo may be coming back a little bit again. And I think my next video will also be in Zen 2, but something a little bit different, maybe unexpected from my perspective. And I will also have some exciting news on a different topic soon. Something I've been working on in the background for a few months now, and is now inching closer to completion. But until next time, we'll catch you later guys.